This is lecture number 25 in our course on fundamentals of transport processes. Welcome. Uh, we were looking at transport in one spatial dimension in the previous lecture, unidirectional transport, where there are variations of the densities of mass, momentum or energy in one spatial direction and possibly in time as well. And the transport, the, the, the balance equation for the transport is basically of this form. The change of mass, momentum or energy within a differential volume is what comes in minus what goes out plus any accumulation or depletion. In the case of mass and energy, possibly due to reactions. In the case of momentum, the accumulation is due to body forces. The rates of transport are the rates of transport across the surface of this differential volume for two reasons. One is due to convection and the other is due to diffusion. The convective flux is just the normal velocity times the density of mass, momentum or energy. The diffusive flux is given by the constitutive relations and we put these two together to get the differential equations. In the last lecture, we were looking at uh, transport in one dimension, a heat transfer problem, an infinite fluid uh, bounded by a flat surface. Uh, the entire system is at a constant temperature initially and at time t is equal to 0, you heat up the surface to a higher temperature and one would like to see how the temperature varies within the fluid. I had explained to you that this is an idealization of a problem where we set a container on a heated surface okay. and we had derived the balance equations for that case okay, for the energy density by considering a small differential volume here, a small differential thickness in the direction of the variations. Okay. So, you have to take a differential uh, thickness or a differential volume in the direction of the variation in the temperature and write a balance for that. Okay. And that balance of course ended up being of the form uh, uh, the change in energy is equal to what comes in minus what goes out and we got a relation of this kind. Okay. The rate of change of energy within that volume is equal to the difference in flux divided by the thickness. Okay. What comes in minus what goes out divided by the thickness plus sources of energy and then we had used the constitutive relation for the heat flux to get this energy balance equation okay, which contains the thermal diffusivity and the sources or sinks of energy. Exactly the same formulation can be done for the concentration field and you get an equation of exactly the same form except that the instead of the temperature it is the concentration variation that is being considered instead of the thermal diffusivity it is the mass diffusivity instead of the thermal source of thermal energy it is the source of mass due to reactions. And uh, we had actually done the same for momentum the formulation is slightly different rate of change of momentum is equal to sum of the forces. Okay. The forces are of two types one is body forces and the other is surface forces. Body forces like gravitational force, centrifugal force are proportional to the volume being considered. Okay, they are proportional to the mass which is the density times the volume. Surface forces are due to momentum transfer across surfaces and in this case we had used a slightly different sign convention. The force is considered positive for if the outward unit normal to the volume is in the plus z direction and therefore we had caught a slight difference in the sign of the stresses, there was a difference in the sign of the constitutive relation as well. So, ultimately the final relation that we got was similar in form to the uh, mass and energy balance equations. Substitute velocity for concentration, momentum diffusivity or kinematic viscosity for mass diffusivity and the ratio of the force and the density instead of the concentration source or the mass source. 
So, these are partial differential equations, they contain variations both in time as well as in the spatial coordinate and we looked at how to solve these equations. As I said, there is no systematic procedure for solving partial differential equations. The procedure that you adopt depends upon a physical insight into the problem. We had done one such solution for a surface which is heated at T is equal to 0. Initially the temperature is just a constant everywhere, okay. initially the temperature is just a constant everywhere. At time T is equal to 0 you heat the surface so that this surface temperature increases to a higher value okay. and then as the th heat diffuses through the medium the temperature is going to increase further and further away. Very far from the surface this is an infinite fluid. So, very far from the surface the temperature is still going to be the undisturbed temperature. Okay. So, very far from the surface the temperature is still equal to the undisturbed temperature. At the initial time at T is equal to 0 the temperature is set equal to okay, T naught and however at T is equal to 0 the heating has just started therefore the temperature okay, in the fluid is still equal to T infinity. Okay. We had scaled the equations by this form okay, and got a, 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 a conduction equation for the scaled variables. Okay. And then we had used this additional bit of insight. Since there are no time or length scales in the problem by which one can scale the distance and time, okay. the only dimensional parameter in this problem is the thermal diffusivity alpha. There are no other dimensional parameters. So, out of length, time and alpha one can get only one dimensionless group and that is this uh, dimensionless group here okay, which I had called the similarity variable in the previous lecture. Okay. Therefore, I can express the equation for the temperature in terms of this dimensionless group and if I do that I reduce the coordinates from 2 to 1 in this problem. Okay. You express it in terms of psi using chain rule for differentiation because psi depends upon t and on, on y and you get this equation which is an equation which is only a function of psi does not contain individually z and time. Okay. And this equation can be solved, Okay, we got a solution okay, for this equation. We had applied boundary conditions and this was the final solution. Okay. It contains an integral, this integral cannot be evaluated analytically, but it can always be evaluated numerically okay. and this solution is the same okay. whether you consider mass transfer, heat transfer or momentum transfer. Okay. You can consider the heat, uh, from this you can calculate the heat flux and the total heat transported okay. and therefore you get exactly the same set of solutions whether it is mass, heat or momentum transfer. And we had actually looked at one practical application where this is uh, actually can give you a correlation and that was a falling film. Okay. Rather than considering a film that is falling in space, since the velocity of that falling film close to the interface was a constant okay, due to the zero shear stress at the condi condition at the interface, the velocity has to tend to a constant value at that interface. Okay. Since the velocity was nearly a constant, we had assumed that we were moving in a reference frame moving with the film. In that reference frame, the film is stationary okay, and therefore, we can monitor the progress of the concentration field with time. Okay. And the time elapsed is just equal to the distance travel divided by the flow velocity, the maximum flow velocity. Okay. So, on the basis of this, we had got an equation for the concentration field which now contained the flow velocity instead of time. Okay. And once we had done that, we managed to get the flux at the surface as a function of downstream distance and then we had calculated the average flux averaged over the downstream distance averaged over x and from that we had actually got a correlation for the Sherwood number. Rather than a heated surface which is heated at T is equal to 0, we had considered, uh, we had looked at the limitations and so on and found that even if the distance is of the order of tens of meters, 
a film thickness of about a millimeter is adequate to ensure that the penetration depth is much smaller than the film thickness. Okay. Okay. So, that is that is the reason why this approximation is expected to work extremely well in, 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 in real applications. Okay. We had gone to another problem which was the decay of a pulse. Okay. You initially inject a pulse of fluid at the plane z is equal to 0. Okay. The pulse is a mass per unit area. Okay. So, you instantaneously inject a mass of fluid within an infinitesimal thickness. Okay. You inject a mass of fluid within an infinitesimal thickness over here. Okay. So, everywhere else the mass is equal to 0. At the surface itself the mass is a finite value per unit area. Okay. And the diffusion equation remains exactly the same. However, the difference is that as the mass diffuses outwards due to molecular diffusion, the total mass per unit area has to be preserved. Okay. The total mass per unit area has to be preserved. So, that at t is equal to 0, okay, the concentration is non-zero only at z is equal to 0. Okay. The concentration is non-zero only at z is equal to 0. It is equal to 0 everywhere else. The integral of the concentration okay, over the entire region is equal to m. Okay. This is an idealization. Okay. This is called a delta function. Okay. So, I will just briefly introduce that. Okay. If I have a function okay, f of z as a function of this coordinate z. Okay. The delta function okay, is basically defined as a function okay, about the origin z is equal to 0, okay, which has a width h. Okay. The width of this function is equal to h and the height is equal to 1 over h. If you take the limit for as h goes to 0 of this function f of z, this is a delta function delta of z. Okay. Note that the height is equal to 1 over h okay, and the width is equal to h. As you take the limit of h going to 0, the width goes to 0, the height goes to infinity in such a way that the product of the 2 is equal to 1. Okay. So, that is a delta function. Since the product of the 2 is equal to 1, integral dz delta of z okay, from minus infinity to infinity is equal to 1. Okay. Okay, the integral, the area under the curve is equal to 1. Okay. However, delta of z is equal to 0 for z is not equal to 0. Okay. This is the idealization of a function that is restricted to a very thin region. Okay about z is equal to 0, the height goes to infinity in such a way that the product of the 2 is equal to 1. Okay. And this delta function also has the property that if I take any function g of z okay, and if I take the integral of the function dz g of z times delta of z, okay, this delta of z is 0 when z is not equal to 0 and the area under the curve is equal to 1. Okay. So, this function is just equal to the value of the function at g at z is equal to 0. Okay. Okay. So, this is the idealization what is called a delta function. Of course, real functions are never delta functions. Okay. When you inject it there is always going to be a thickness. Okay. So, therefore, when we solve this problem, we are considering the case where the spread is much larger than the initial thickness. So, that the details of the initial thickness do not affect the spread at long times. Okay. So, that is the delta function and this concentration field at t is equal to 0 okay, okay. At t is equal to 0, I said c is equal to 0 for z not equal to 0 and the integral is equal to m. Okay. So, therefore, I could very well have written the concentration field c at z 0 is equal to m times delta. 
of z. Okay. So, the magnitude of the concentration is m times delta of z. Okay. If you recall when I talked about the delta function, I said the height is 1 over h. Okay. Therefore, this delta function has dimensions of of 1 by distance okay. because the height of this function is 1 over h and h is a distance. So, the delta function has dimensions of 1 over distance okay. that is also evident from this equation here. Okay. Delta of z times z is dimensionless therefore, delta of z has dimensions of 1 over distance okay. and if we go back to our formula here you can see that if I write c is equal to m times delta of z okay, then m has dimensions of mass per unit area okay, it is a mass per unit area that was injected okay, at that z is equal to 0. Delta has dimensions of 1 over distance therefore, the concentration correctly has dimensions of mass per unit volume. Okay. So, we inject a pulse that means that at t is equal to 0 the concentration field is this delta function okay. and then we follow the progression with time. Okay. In this case as well there are no length or time scales in the problem therefore, I should be able to define everything in terms of this dimensionless group. Okay. However, the concentration field is evolving okay as time progresses okay initially the concentration is large okay as the material spreads okay as the material spreads the total mass has to be preserved that means that the maximum of this concentration has to come lower and lower okay so the maximum value of this concentration is actually a function of time okay and that comes out of this balance condition that the integral okay of Okay, it comes out of the balance condition that the integral of dz times c of z t at any point of time. Okay, this is the total mass per unit area in this system, okay, the total mass per unit area along the plane. This has to be equal to m at any instant of time okay, because the original mass is diffusing, there is no accumulation or depletion of mass. Therefore, the original mass that was there at the initial time is present for all further times. This mass balance condition is the condition that I had over here okay, the mass balance that the total mass is preserved. In that sense it is slightly different from the previous problem okay. and therefore, if I write this integral condition in terms of the similarity variable psi right, I find that this concentration field has to scale as m by root dt times some function of psi. Okay. So, there is a time dependence in the prefactor. In the previous case there was no time dependence because we had just fixed the concentration. In this case the mass is fixed that means that the maximum concentration should scale as 1 over the spread okay. the spread is square root of dt. Okay. And once we had that we had solved it okay. and we had got the concentration field. Okay. Okay. This is the concentration field. Okay. This is what is called a Gaussian okay. uh, it goes by the name of a Gaussian plume okay. the concentration field due to the spreading of a scalar. Okay. As you can see it decreases as a bell shaped curve a Gaussian curve. Okay. So, therefore, the curve okay, uh, C as a function of psi okay. it is a bell shaped curve symmetric it goes to 0 at plus or minus infinity. Okay. So, it is a Gaussian curve okay. the area under the curve is always preserved. Okay. Alternatively if you were to do it in terms of uh, uh, the if you were to do it in terms of the spatial coordinate z. Okay. Initially, I said it is going to be a delta function, it is going to be non zero only at z is equal to 0, and the thickness is going to go as 1 over the width. As time progresses, it there will be a spread, okay. 
okay. And this spread you can actually calculate, you can calculate the variance of the spread okay, uh, by simply taking the variance as, okay. so let us get rid of this delta function here since we already completed it. Okay, I know that concentration is equal to m by 2 root pi dt e power minus okay, z square pi 4 dt okay. and that has a shape that looks something like this. Okay. If I want to find out the variance of this, okay, I can take the variance okay, uh, the sigma square is equal to integral over z of z square times the concentration divided by integral dz of the concentration. Okay. Integral over dz of the concentration is just the total mass m okay. and I can take integral over of z square dz both from minus infinity to infinity. Okay. In order to find out the mean square of the displacement or the mean square of the spread okay. and this you can calculate quite easily okay. this just equal to 2 dt. Okay. So, the variance of this distribution function is increasing proportional to time okay, in this case. Now, this I did only in one dimension I assumed that there was a particular amount of material being put in at time t is equal to 0 and I was looking at the spread as a function of time. Okay. I could also do it in three dimensions. Okay. I would not go through the details here, but in three dimensions what I would do is okay, I have a three dimensional space x, y, z. At time t is equal to 0, I would put a spot at the center, okay. put in a certain amount of mass m put in a certain amount of mass m at the center. Okay. So, this mass m is finite, it is being put into an infinitesimal volume. Okay. Therefore, this is now a delta function in the x, y and z directions. Okay. Therefore, I would have to solve the problem in the x, y and z directions subject to the condition that integral dx minus infinity to infinity. of c of x y z t is equal to m. Okay. The initial mass that was injected at that particular point, okay, it is spreading with time. As time progresses, it will spread further and further. Okay. I can solve that problem. I will not go through the details, but it is exactly analogous to this. The total amount of mass is m. Therefore, you are solving the differential equations in three dimensions now. Okay. It turns out the differential equation is of the form dc by dt is equal to d into d square c by dx square plus d square c by dy square plus d square c by dz square. I will not go into the details of how you get this, we will see later in the course, but I will just give you the result here. The concentration is equal to mass times the delta function of x, delta function of y delta function of z because the spot is confined in all three directions the x, y and z directions. Okay. So, therefore, you have three delta functions. Each delta function I had told you has dimensions of 1 over length. Therefore, mass times 1 over length cubed is a concentration. Okay. So, this is the concentration at t equals 0. Okay. And the solution for this concentration field is exactly analogous c is equal to 1 by 2 root pi dt whole cubed okay, e power minus okay, 
x square plus y square plus z square by 4 d t. Okay, this is a Gaussian function in three dimensions and this so it is spreading symmetrically. Okay. You can see that it is symmetric with respect to x, y and z okay. and x square plus y square plus z square is equal to r square where r is the distance from the origin. Okay. So, it is spreading symmetrically in all three directions. Okay. In this case the concentration goes as t to the minus 3 halves. Okay. In this case the concentration goes as t to the minus 3 halves. Okay. You can see it over here okay, 1 over t to the 3 halves because it is spreading in three directions. In the previous case it was spreading only in one direction therefore it was going as 1 over t to the half. Okay. The variance in the x direction is equal to the variance in the y direction is equal to the variance in the z direction each of these is equal to 2 dt. Okay. Therefore, the variance in the radial spread okay, will be equal to 6 dt okay, in this case. Okay. So, that is for a symmetric plume okay, which is spreading. Now, why did I talk about this? Because this is actually of practical application. Okay. If you had for example, a gas coming out of a smokestack, okay, gas coming out of a smokestack, smoke. Okay. Okay. This smoke will, will spread out, okay. it will have fluctuating velocities and so on. In this case, the spreading out is actually due to turbulent fluctuations, it is not due to molecular fluctuations, okay. it is due to turbulent eddies. Okay. And therefore, the spreading is not due to molecular diffusion, but due to turbulent diffusion. However, in even in that case, you can use a Gaussian approximation for this plume to examine the rate at which it is spreading. Okay. So, if I had a solution of this kind, okay, if I had a concentration solution of this kind, okay, I could use it even when there is turbulent okay, dispersion. This is not molecular diffusion, but rather due to turbulent eddies. Only difference is that instead of the diffusion coefficient here, I will have what is called a dispersion coefficient okay, E. Okay, I will have a dispersion coefficient E okay, which tells me the rate at which the turbulent eddies are spreading the material okay, within this plume because it is actually a turbulent plume. Okay. And this dispersion coefficient can actually be calculated back from the rate at which it is spreading. So, if I know okay, after a certain time how much it has spread, using this model I can find out what is the dispersion coefficient okay, in this turbulent plume. Okay. Similarly, in cases of laminar flows where I have dispersion rather than diffusion. Okay, if I have a packed bed for example, which consists of densely packed particles, which consists of densely packed particles. A porous medium if you will. As the fluid flows through this medium, okay, it undergoes numerous changes in direction okay. and the fact that it has to go through the interstices of this medium generates velocity fluctuations okay. and that can once again enhance mixing. Okay. That can once again enhance mixing because this fluid is constantly changing direction as it is going through the medium. Okay. Therefore, the rate at which the spreading takes place in this case will not be molecular diffusion alone but it contains a convective effect because the, uh, the material, the fluid is changing directions constantly. If I want to find out the rate at which it is spreading, I can put in a pulse at this location, okay. put in a pulse of, of solute at this location okay. and then see a little while later. Okay. 
I can put in a pulse of solute at this location and then see a little while later how much it has spread. Okay. What is the spread in this pulse a little while later? Okay. From knowing the spread and the time that has elapsed between these two, okay. the time that has elapsed between these two and knowing the spread, I can find out what is the dispersion coefficient in this case as well. Okay. If it is spreading in one direction, then I will use my previous expression. Okay. If it is spreading only in one direction, then this expression can be used. If it is spreading in two or three directions, you can use the, the, the two dimensional or three dimensional delta functions. Okay. So, this model is actually very useful for calculating what are dispersion coefficients due to turbulence or due to flow through porous media and so on. They are not molecular diffusion, but since the equation is similar in this case except that you substitute the molecular diffusion coefficient with a turbulent diffusion coefficient, solutions are the same. From the solutions knowing how much it has spread in a certain interval of time, you can calculate what are these dispersion coefficients which are enhanced due to either turbulence or due to the flow through a porous medium where the fluid velocity is constantly changing direction. And that is why this is a fundamental solution. Okay, the Gaussian plume is a fundamental solution which can be used to deduce what are dispersion coefficients. It is useful not just in molecular diffusion, but in other cases as well where dispersion could be enhanced due to fluid velocity fluctuations generated in porous media or due to turbulence or due to other reasons. So, these were all transport problem phenomena problems in infinite domains. What does one do if we are to solve a problem in a finite domain? That I will start in the next lecture. I okay. will see you then.